And we on now to item 1.3 of our agenda, which is land acknowledgement and moment of reflection. We respectfully acknowledge that Kent Lakes and Peterborough County are located on the Treaty 20 Mitchisaugi territory and in the traditional territory of the Mitchisaugi and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nation, which include Alderville, Bowser Lake, Curve Lake, Georgina Island, Hiawatha, Rama, and Scubog Island First Nation. Kent Lakes respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We will now take a moment to reflect on these principles and our duties and responsibilities as members of Council. Okay, I would like to acknowledge Ann Beck. Ann Beck has provided notice that she is retiring after 25 years. She will be retiring as one of our Trent Lakes Christmas Hampers organizers. Donations received through the Trent Lakes Christmas Hampers Fund will allow, allow Ann and her dedicated group of volunteers to create Christmas food hampers for those in need. Hundreds of families have been assisted through this program for the past 25 years. On behalf of council, staff, and the community, I would like to thank Ann for her dedicated service and her compassion for others. Thank you. We can move on to item two of our agenda, which is disclosure of pecuniary interest. I would like to remind the members of council, if you have a pecuniary interest on an item in the agenda, please state it now or any time during the meeting prior to discussing anything on the item you have an interest in. We move on to item three of our agenda, which is the approval of the agenda. And I will make a motion to approve the agenda is circulated. See Councillor Cadigan for a mover. And Deputy Mayor Armstrong is a seconder. Any conversation? And seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can move on to item four of our agenda, which is the adoption of the minutes. Item 4.1 is the regular council meeting of September the 5th. We need Councillor Braver for a mover and Councillor Brandon for a seconder. Any conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We move on to item five of our agenda, which is committees and boards. Item 5.1 is the library board meeting of June 9th and September 8th. Item 5.2 is the committee of adjustment from July 11th. We can do them both together or we're going to do them separately. We also count. Okay. Any motion? Deputy Mayor. Uh, motion to accept vote. Okay. You have a seconder for that motion. Councilor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? We call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Liaison reports and council boards and committees. Anyone have anything to discuss? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Lambton. Um, from the library, uh, September is library card sign up month, and they're encouraging all residents to come and get a library card, which gives you access not only to the physical collection of materials, but also to all the online resources. And I won't ask publicly, but I would just ask whether all members of the council can get the library card. We found out some of our board members never had one before, so I can just think about it. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Just mentioned to you there, if you have a card, you don't need to give me one, correct? Correct. Card might not be mine. Mine might be in the <laughs> <laughs> I think they've changed them maybe since the last time you got yours. <laughs> well, I am an avid reader, so I should be kidding. I must have missed. I will do that. Thank you for watching. Any other questions? I would entertain them. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. through you, Mayor. That's uh, in reference to uh, Lakers Hall. Uh, October 14th, um, Lakers Hall is going to be hosting a concert by the Abrams. And it's going to be uh, it's a special occasion. And so it'll be coming up you know, later in the agenda. And I want to thank our clerk for uh, accommodating uh, the Lakers uh, board to your trust. Thank you. Thank you very much for making that to our attention. 
Okay. We can move on now to item six of our agenda, which is a statutory public meeting pursuant to the planning. And I will make a motion to go into that meeting and suspend our regular council. Councilor Franzen for a mover. And Deputy Armstrong for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We are now in our public meeting. Okay, we can move on to item 6.1 of our agenda. And Sarah Delamarter, would you like to speak to this last? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. This is a public meeting under Section 34 of the Planning Act to consider an amendment to the Municipalities Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, B2014-070. Sorry, Rose, can you just turn your audio off? We can still hear it. It's giving some feedback. Thank you. Um, a notice of public meeting for today's application containing the prescribed information was circulated to all landowners within a 120 meter radius of the subject lands at least 20 days prior to this meeting. The notice was also mailed to all prescribed agencies, public bodies, and persons in accordance with the regulations. Anyone wanting to be notified of any decision from today's public meeting must send in a written request to either myself or the clerk and the notice of passing will be mailed to them setting out the method and manner in which appeals may be made to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Please note that if a person does not send a written comment prior to the passing of the bylaw or make an oral submission at a public meeting, that person may not be entitled to appeal the decision. Uh, the first application we have is a public meeting for file number 23-11 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by property owners Craig McLeod Adams and Sarah Barbara Ann Adams to fulfill a condition of consent for file numbers B-6-22 and B-7-22. The parcels are located along Bass Lake Road and were part of the property known municipally as 228 Bass Lake Road. The consent applications resulted in the creation of two new vacant lots. The lot resulting from severance B-6-22 contains a lot area of 0 0.34 hectares or 0 0.84 acres with 54.8 meters of frontage on Bass Lake Road. The lot resulting from severance B-7-22 contains a lot area of 0.4 hectares or 0.9 acres with 48.98 meters of frontage on Bass Lake Road. The severed lands do not front upon a water body and thus a rezoning condition was added to the municipal appraisal form to rezone both this, of the severed lots to the rural residential zone as it is a more appropriate zone category than the current shoreline residential zone. No site plan has been submitted to staff delineating proposed development for the vacant lots at this point in time. The retained lands are to be rezoned in order to recognize the existing dwelling setback to the high water mark, which does not conform to the comprehensive zoning bylaws 30 meter setback, and to rezone part of the retained lands to the environmental protection zone to recognize the confirmed wetland features identified by the submitted environmental impact study. The application was accompanied by a natural heritage report, a peer review of the natural heritage report, and an an archaeological assessment and an art plan. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's planning staff. The report states that the application is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Peterborough Public Health provided a comment to the municipality stating that they have no objection to the proposed amendment. No further comments were received from the circulated agencies about the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, one request was received from a neighboring property owner to be notified of the decision from today's meeting. Other than this, no further comments have been received from any neighboring property owners. No comments were received expressing an intent to submit an oral submission at the public meeting. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission but would like to do so at this time, Please either raise your hand in the physical gallery or use the raise a hand feature in the virtual gallery so that we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Sarah Dillamother, our junior planner. Uh, is there anyone in the gallery for or against this application, either virtual or living and real and present? 
I'm seeing you more. Any comments or questions from any members of council? I'm seeing none. Okay. I think we can just move on to our next item. Okay, so now I think we can move on to item 6.2 of our agenda. Ms. Sarah Dillamarker, our junior planner, can you please speak to the board? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. This is a public meeting for file number 23-13 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by Gerald Hood of Integrity Home and Cottage Incorporated on behalf of the property owner Bradley John Ramsey for the property known municipally as 22 Fire Route 282A. The subject land has a shoreline frontage of approximately 31 meters and a lot area of approximately 0.6 acres. The applicant's lot is currently occupied by a dwelling with a ground floor area of 126.23 square meters, a shoreline guest cabin with a ground floor area of 19.32 square meters, and a two-story detached accessory garage with a ground floor area of 45.7 square meters. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing dwelling and shoreline guest cabin. The applicant intends to replace the existing dwelling with a replacement two-story dwelling and attached garage with a ground floor area of 246.1 square meters and a total floor area of 325 square meters. An attached open air deck and covered deck will also be constructed on the proposed dwelling, which will have a combined floor area of 57 square meters. The purpose of the application is to seek relief from the proposal's minimum water yard setback, setback from a private road, and interior side yard setback. The proposed dwelling setback to the high water mark is proposed at 15.24 meters when the permitted setback in the bylaw is 30 meters. The lake facing deck will be set back approximately 14.6 meters from the high water mark. The proposed dwelling will be set back a distance of two meters from the private road, whereas the bylaw permits a minimum setback of 12 meters. Additionally, the proposed replacement dwelling will be located approximately 1.2 meters from the interior side lot line, whereas the permitted setback is 4.5 meters in the comprehensive zoning bylaw. The applicants have submitted a shoreline restoration plan in support of the proposal and have undertaken an archaeological assessment, which has yielded no findings. The applicants underwent a minor variance in 2018, where it obtained approval on February 6, 2018, for a replacement dwelling resulting in an increased ground floor area of more than 50%, with a deficient water yard setback and reduced interior minimum side yard setback. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's uh, external planning consultant, pardon me, Chris Jones. Chris's report states that the application is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Chris notes that the law is characterized by a rock shelf to the rear of the existing dwelling, creating a constraint to options for a viable building envelope. Additionally, Chris notes that the existing dwelling appeared to be in derelict state and was in a state of interior demolition. Peterborough Public Health has provided a comment to the municipality stating that they have no objection to the proposed amendment. There have been no further comments received from any circulated agencies or neighboring property owners with respect to this proposal. No request has been made for anyone to speak on behalf of the proposal prior to the scheduled meeting. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission, but would like to do so at this time, please use the raise a hand feature if you're in the virtual gallery or physically raise your hand now if you're in the physical gallery so that we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Okay, is there anyone in the virtual gallery or the real gallery that would like to speak to this file? I am seeing none. Do we have anyone online? Does anyone have any members of council have any questions of Sarah? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Lamb said. Um, Sarah, it wasn't clear to me whether they were preparing to remove the existing garage. I saw that there was a willingness to remove the um, guest cabin, but I didn't see anything about the garage, the existing garage. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you through you mr mayor um they do not intend to remove the existing two-story garage they only intend to remove the the shoreline um guest cabin so follow-up questions if i may so is that garage included in the 14 percent lot coverage 
Uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, thank you. And also through you is the second floor of the garage. What is that being used for? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's the applicant states that it is currently being used for storage. Okay, thank you. And that is what we need to be for the permit to build that, right? Okay, any other questions? And seeing none. Okay. No virtual gallery. Okay, we can move on to our next item. We can move on to 6.3 and say hello to Dylan Marker, our junior planner. Would you please speak to the five? You're Thank busy you. today. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. This is a public meeting for file number 23-14 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by agent J. Lori Young on behalf of the property owner, Gregory Joseph Livings, for the property known municipally as 401 Water Access Only Gold Lake. The subject land has a shoreline frontage of approximately 110 meters and a lot area of approximately 0.6 acres. The applicant's lot is currently occupied by a dwelling and attached deck with a combined floor area of 51 square meters and a guest cabin with a ground floor area of approximately 21.7 square meters. There is also an attached deck with a floor area of approximately 3.4 square meters. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing dwelling and replace it with a replacement dwelling with a ground floor area of 203.1 square meters and a total floor area of 262.5 square meters, an attached deck with a floor area of 135.2 square meters, and an attached covered porch with a floor area of 14.5 square meters. The purpose of the application is to seek relief from the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaws minimum water yard setback for both the dwelling and the guest cabin, in addition to an interior side yard setback. The proposed dwelling setback to the high water mark is proposed at 7.47 meters when the permitted setback in the bylaw is 30 meters. The lake facing deck will be set back approximately 4.52 meters from the high water mark. The existing guest cabin will be set back 16 point, or, pardon me, 18.6 meters from the high water mark. Additionally, the proposed dwelling will be located approximately 1.26 meters from the interior side lot line whereas the permitted setback is 4.5 meters in the comprehensive zoning bylaw. The applicants have submitted a natural heritage evaluation in support of the proposed application. The applicants have also provided a copy of the archeological assessment, which yielded no findings. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's external planning consultant, Chris Jones. Chris's report states that the application is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan for the Great and Golden Horseshoe. Chris notes that the proposed dwelling is substantially located within the water yard setback. However, the configuration and width of the applicant's lot makes it impossible to construct any building or structure in compliance with the minimum 30 meter water yard setback. Peterborough Public Health has provided a comment to the municipality stating that they have no objection to the proposed amendment. There have been no further comments received from any circulated agencies or neighboring property owners with respect to this proposal. No request has been made for anyone to speak on behalf of the proposal prior to the scheduled meeting. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission but would like to do so at this time, Please use the raise a hand feature if you're in the virtual gallery or physically raise your hand now if you're in the physical gallery so that we were able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there anyone in the, I will use your terminology, physical gallery or virtual gallery that would like to speak to this file? We are seeing no hands. Okay, is there any comments from any members of council regarding this? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Lindsay. Just a clarification, it's called a water access only property and yet there's reference to in a map of an access road. So I didn't know exactly how the residents did access their property. <laughs> uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the applicants currently don't have legal access onto the road that's registered on title. Um, they have a water access only title because they don't have a green sign for use of uh, the fire route 
um, they do have an application in with the municipality to utilize the two road allowances that they pass to access their property via vehicle, mm -hmm. um, which is part of the approval uh, for the bylaw is that they enter into an agreement with us to to use those those road allowances. Great. Thank you. Very helpful. And there is some significant geological features in there that might make that a little problematic. Yeah. That's a future thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing no other comments. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Cadigan. Uh, comment through you, Mayor Lamb said, I'm well aware of this property. I uh, knew previous owners, and I have to say that I'm disappointed with the current owners and what they've done to the lot. They've pretty much clear cut the lot, which wasn't a very large lot, but it was a hemlock forest and naturalized, and now it's barren, except for the point they've left some trees, but uh, I just wanted to express that disappointment. Thank you very much for your comment, Councillor Cadigan. Things might change in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments? Go ahead, Councillor Brandt. Yeah, I'm uh, just uh, wondering what's the square footage of the new uh, build? I, you have it in meters, but my mind doesn't work in meters. <laughs> of course. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the proposed dwelling has a ground floor area of 2,186 square feet and a total floor area of 2,827 square feet. Follow up for the mayor. Um, sure. And uh, what would the percentage of the lot coverage be on that uh, build? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I think it's in the report uh, from the external planning yeah. consultant. I don't know it offhand. 17%. 17%. 17%. 17%. Okay. Oh. Thank you. And you're allowed 20. Okay. Is that all your questions, Councillor Friend? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mayor. Any other questions or comments? No one in the physical or virtual gallery. Okay. We can move on to item 6.4 of our agenda. And I believe Adele Arbor, our planner, is going to speak to this file. Yes, thank you. And through you, Mary Lambshead, this is a public meeting for file number 23-17 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by agent John Hubbard on behalf of owner Deborah Powis for the property municipally known as 1833 Crystal Lake Road. The subject land has a shoreline frontage along Crystal Lake of approximately 32.55 meters or 106.79 feet and a lot area of approximately 30.37 of a hectare or 0.93 of an acre. The property is designated in the official plan as recreational dwelling area and is zoned shoreline residential special exception-23. The property currently exhibits a dwelling accessory detached garage, storage shed, guest cabin, and a boathouse. This property underwent a zoning bylaw amendment in 2017 in order to permit a guest cabin and a boathouse to continue to exist where they were constructed without the benefit of a building permit. The bylaw amendment also recognized the existing dwelling's footprint and limited the maximum size of a dwelling on the subject lands to 104.65 square meters or 1,126.5 square feet. The purpose of this zoning bylaw amendment application is to allow the applicants to construct a larger replacement dwelling in the water yard and to recognize its proposed size with a ground floor area proposed at 153.1 square meters or 1,648 square feet and a gross floor area of 186.7 square meters or 2,006 square feet. This represents a slightly less than 50% increase, which meets the expansion and replacement zone provisions in the zoning bylaw. The replacement dwelling will be slightly improving the existing non-compliant dwellings water yard setback from 10.97 meters or 36 feet to 13.1 meters, 42.92 feet. This public meeting notice included the applicant's request to utilize a second story loft area of the existing detached garage as temporary living accommodations while the replacement dwelling was being constructed. 
The planning report on today's agenda was supportive of the applicant's request. However, the applicants after review of a draft temporary use agreement, which was circulated to them last week, identified that they were not prepared to sign the temporary use agreement. The zoning bylaw amendment that was posted in the council agenda on Tuesday was replaced on Friday, removing the temporary use permissions. There is a planning report, which is in support of the application and identifies that the application is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan for the Golden, Greater Golden Horseshoe and meets the intent of Trent Lake's official plan. Agency comments have been received from Peterborough Public Health and Court the Conservation Authority in support of this application. Peterborough Public Health identifies that they have an application for a new sewage system and are awaiting Kawartha Conservation's approval and municipal approval regarding the proposed garage use. Kawartha Con Conservation supports the zoning bylaw amendment application and advises a permit is required for construction. In addition, we have also received an email from an adjacent property owner, Janet Drummond, in support of this application. This concludes the summary of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application. Mr. Mayor, I now turn it over to you for the public input portion of the meeting. Thank you very much, Adele Harbour, our planner. Is there anyone in the gallery for or against this application, either physical or virtual? <clears throat> Go ahead, if you just state your name for the record. My name is John Howard. I'm in for us for it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Or questions? Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. Um, I, I was a little concerned about the temporary use agreement uh, as I read through this because um, I'm sure we're all aware of people who have done that and then never <laughs> disconnected the sewage and the water. Um, so I guess my question is, since the uh, uh, residents are not prepared to sign that, it's probably none of our business, but do we know what their plans are, in fact, for uh, being perhaps located on the site while the construction is going on? We making arrangements to come yeah, out. Go ahead. Yes, we can. Yeah. Through the chair. Yeah, just through the chair. That's fine. Okay. Um, we made, we're making arrangements for a neighboring place. There's a, a death in a neighboring uh, their place to be vacant, so we can make use of that. The issue we ran into was that the agreement came up within days of this. We've got timelines of contractors to have to start the process. Um, some financial imp impact we don't move forward, so we decided that we find alternatives. We can't live in a trailer on because my wife and I both work from there. So we found alternative alternative use because Excellent. it just wasn't time to build that out and then also get the permit to reconstruct. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your sharing that with us. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead, Councillor Caddick. Through you, Mayor, my question is regarding shoreline, shoreline road allowance. Is it owned by? It is owned. Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. The property owners own the shore road allowance. Okay. Just a picture indicated otherwise. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead and tell. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted Council to know that um, in keeping with our practice, any site plan development agreement or temporary use agreement, they're signed by our director of building and planning. And so they don't come to council, but in keeping with our protocol, the agreement is to the benefit of the municipality. We had security identified in there that uh, we required. So in case the uh, temporary living accommodations were not reverted back, we do have the financial resources to do that and also put any additional funds beyond the 10,000 if it was required um, to put it on the uh, taxes. So there is uh, provisions in our agreements that we provide that are tight in terms of making sure that things are reverted back to what they're intended to be. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. Thanks very much for that, Adele, because that, that has been a concern in the past. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, the only other question is a clarification. So is there a, a necessary inspection that takes place after the construction to ensure that those services have in fact been disconnected? 
through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. There would be an inspection. However, the property owner has identified that they do not wish to proceed with the temporary use agreement. So that agreement is null and void and they've made uh, temporary living arrangements um, off site of the property. It's just a general question. Yeah, no, thank you for your questions. Thank you, thank you for your, your answer. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? I am I would now entertain a motion to reconvene our regular council meeting. I can see Councilor Cadigan for a mover. Councilor Braver for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We are back into our regular council meeting. We can move on to item seven of our agenda, which is business arising out of the statutory public meeting. And we can move on to 7.1. It's over Devil Marker, our junior planner. Would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. There is a public meeting held for file number 23-11. At this time, staff are recommending that Council 1 receives the report from planning staff and 2, that Council supports the requested zoning bylaw amendment attached to today's agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Are anyone prepared to make that a motion? Go ahead, Councilor Braver. Thank you, through you, Mayor. I'll make a motion that Council receive the report and that Council approve the zoning bylaw amendment uh, as written. Okay, we have a motion for that. I have a seconder is Councilor Cadigan. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, we can move on to item 7.2 of our agenda. And Sarah Del Marte, would you like to speak to this file? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. There was a public meeting held for file number 23-13. At this time, staff are recommending that Council 1 receives the report from the external planning consultant, Chris Jones, and 2, that Council directs staff to prepare a zoning bylaw amendment for Council's consideration subsequent to the applicant slash owner entering into a site plan agreement to implement recommended shoreline restoration measures and a construction plan and schedule for alterations <coughs> to the private road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lance. I'd, I'd like to make that motion with an amendment um, to receive the report and to direct staff to prepare a zoning bylaw amendment uh, for council's consideration that includes a requirement to remove the guest cabin, which the owner has said they would be willing to do, just to relieve the pressure on the, uh, the land and the water. Do I have a seconder for that motion? See Councilor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item 7.3 of our agenda. And Sir General Marker, will you, our junior planner, will you speak to this file? I'm glad we don't pay you by the word. <laughs> I'd be a very rich woman. Thank you. Through you, Mr. <laughs> Mayor. Uh, there is a public meeting held for file number 23-14. At this time, staff are recommending that Council 1 receives the report from the external planning consultant, Chris Jones, and uh, 2 has two parts. So that Council directs staff to prepare a zoning bylaw amendment for Council's consideration subsequent to a site plan agreement being executed to implement recommendations of the environmental impact study as well as the shoreline re restoration measures and that the applicant has registered into an appropriate agreement to formalize the use of the unopened road allowances. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone on council prepared to make a motion or have a comment? Go ahead. I'll make, make a motion to give support uh, and uh, with the two recommendations made by staff. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? Seeing Councillor Braver for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. We can move on now to item 7.4 of our agenda. And Del Arbor, would you like to, or Planner, would you like to speak to the file? Yes, thank you. And through you, Mr. Mayor, subsequent to the public meeting held for <laughs> file number 23 17, at this time, count staff recommend the following to council. The council received the report from the planner and further that council approve the revised zoning bylaw amendment, which has removed the request for temporary use of the second story loft area of the detached garage for temporary living accommodations, which is on today's agenda for consideration. Okay, thank you 
very much. Um, Council, have any comments or prepared to make a motion? Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, make a motion to receive the report and to approve the zoning bylaw amendment reflecting the recommendations which are in the report. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. We can now move on to item eight of our agenda, which is presentation. We have Jane Colbert here from Page Friendly Coordinator. I don't see you. Here online. online. Okay, perfect. We can unmute you, Jane, and you can do your presentation. <clears throat> There we go. Uh, will the slides be done for me? Yes, they will. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me today so I can um, share a little bit of information about a trendly Peterborough and um, the last five years and then moving forward to the future. Um, the report card from 2017 to 2020 22 has been um, circulated as well as the community action plan for 2023 to 2027. Next, a friendly Peterborough and greater Peterborough area is part of a larger movement. It was the World Health Organization who encouraged communities to become more age friendly and Peterborough did so in two we were recognized in 2016 by the World Health Organization to be part of that community. Next. Um, we have an advisory committee which is called AFPAC, Age Friendly Peterborough Advisory Committee, that was developed um, for the implement to oversee the implementation of the uh, community action plan that was released in 2017. And during that initial plan, um, four working groups, so four goals were established, and those are basic needs, staying mobile, building relationships, and learning and contributing. Next. This is the structure of age-friendly Peterborough. Um, we are a committee of councils, so we have representatives from City Council, County Council, Curve Lake Council, and, and Hiawatha Council, and each of those um, sends a community uh, representative. Plus, we have the four uh, working group chairs, so AFPAC is made up of 12 individuals. We also have um, task forces who are ad hoc and who um, they focus on a, a particular project um, that is needed during at that time. Next. Well, this is what the 2017 um, Community Action Plan uh, looked like. Um, and for each of those four goals I mentioned, there were strategic directions um, and there were 146 proposed activities uh, listed in the action plan. Next. That plan was um, endorsed and approved by um, the City of Peterborough, uh, Peterborough County, uh, the eight township councils, um, as well as uh, the two First Nations. So Age Friendly Peterborough is representative of the greater Peterborough area. Next. The report card um, that was really just released, um, it is shows and has an update. It provides an update on those proposed actions that were done between 2017 and 2022. And so how the greater Peterborough area has become more um, age friendly since the release of that plan. Next. Just a couple of highlights for, for, from the uh, report card. One is that we did create the Peterborough Senior Service Directory and that is available on our website. It is a list of all services available uh, locally for older adults um, and their caregivers and care providers, as well as options for housing. Um, it's also available, we know uh, we're, we encourage other ways for communication, knowing that not all seniors have computers, have internet, um, or 
from what to use the computer. Uh, so we have provided that information to 211. So if they were to dial 211, they would speak to a community navigator um, who could provide that, that information by phone. Um, another initiative that took place was that we have a housing task force that looks at innovating, innovative housing solutions. And actually just this Wednesday past, we did do a workshop called Shall I Stay or Shall I Go? Um, and it did provide options where if someone would like to stay in their home, what services are available to support them, and also if they would like to move, um, what um, options there are available. Uh, in 2022, community care uh, arranged 33,000 drives to 2,200 people. And this is significant because as we did our community engagement, transportation continues to be a barrier for people being involved in the community and receiving services. Um, another uh, solution to um, some people who live in rural areas was the link was developed and that is transit that is provided from Curve Lake goes through Selwyn uh, in, into Peterborough. So those are some of the initiatives that uh, helped be, um, a greater Peterborough area become more age friendly over the last five years. Next. The process of becoming age friendly is cyclical. So in 2015 and 16, we started, we did community consultation, we developed the, those four goals and those are our key principles. Um, through that needs assessment, uh, we heard what older adults and stakeholders said, we developed the action plan in 2017 and we've just implemented that plan. So we're starting through the cycle a second time. We've decided to keep the, the principles the same, the basic needs, staying mobile, building relationships and learning and contributing. Uh, we have done a needs assessment and that was through surveys, interviews, uh, focus groups, um, and also informal and formal gatherings. Uh, that information is available on the website. We do have a dashboard. Uh, where we've summarized some of the uh, answers from the survey and also some information from Stats Canada that we utilized. Um, and if you would like a full copy of the survey, it's there's a button to click on uh, the dashboard for you to rece receive that. So through that needs assessment, we've now developed the Community Action Plan and that will be for 2023 to 2027. And that's what um, I'd like to um, introduced to you today. Next. Well, the action plan, um, uh, just a little, some results from uh, our research. One is that the number of older adults living in your community, so Trent Lakes, has increased from 30%. So 30% of your population are over the age of 65. Um, and that has increased, sorry, that was in 2016, and that has increased to 32% in 2021. And we anticipate that number is going to grow because when you look at, there's a chart that's in the community action plan and it shows the demographics, the highest uh, range, age range of demographics are not yet 65. So these are the baby boomers who um, have not yet retired. So as they continue to age, the, your, um, the number of older adults will continue to grow in, their, in your community. As, as we know that people purchased um, cottages for their retirement locations in the community. And so therefore, as they retire from other areas, they will move to the greater Peterborough area full time. And that will also increase the number of older adults that require services. Another point on that is that as um, the, the demographic ages, they will require more services. So right now they may be fit and healthy and they're because they're around the age 65, but uh, in the next 20 years, as they age, it will, they will require more services. Another, um, some more results that we found from our research that's really significant uh, to mention is that the number of older adults that are living below um, the 
uh, cost of living, um, LICO, is, um, is increasing. And that is because older adults, um, they're, when they're just on old age security and even guaranteed income supplement, their income does not increase very much. <laughs> I think it's the last time they increased was about $4. Um, so if their income is, st is static and the cost of living greatly increases, as we know it has, the gap is going to get larger and larger. So we're finding that more older adults are using food banks, for example, um, are not able to afford their, their current housing or they're choosing between food and housing. So um, th that is another area that we would like to address. Next. Even though the statistics or the data is very important, we also would like to share some of the impact statements that we heard um, in, during the community engagement. Um, and when asked about if they've lost their home, where would they go? Somebody said, I'm on a fixed income. With rent costs increasing, I'm not so sure where I would go. So we're finding that as, as um, there have been Evictions is what they, they call it, with people um, who have lived in their home for 20 or so years and they've been asked to leave, they cannot afford market, market rent. Um, also, with the rent geared to income and uh, Peterborough Housing Corps, I just met with them last week and the waiting list is between five and seven years to, to receive rent geared to income or affordable housing. So, um, housing is certainly... Um, an issue that we face. Another comment was, I told my family I don't need anything for Christmas. Just buy me depends as I can't afford to buy them myself. So this speaks to the basic needs and not being able to afford uh, what they need. A third one is no one comes to see if I'm okay. No regular community involvement. No one knows I'm here. Speaking to the impact of um, social isolation. Next. So the purpose of the 2023 plan um, is to outline uh, the needs of older adults and that we can focus on action oriented uh, projects. And that would be to work together. So as government organizations, businesses and older adults, um, how can we all work together to contribute to an age-friendly community? Next. Oh, well, uh, we've created a work plan, which I'll show you in just a moment. And um, as I mentioned before, the 2017 plan had all of the actions or proposed activities listed. This time we felt that we wanted to have a higher level framework to allow for actions to be added during the five years as, and that will allow us to have more flexibility. We learned during COVID that um, we, need to, we need to be able to pivot and, and listen to what older adults need and, and then therefore create um, actions to identify those, those needs. Next. Oh, the plan outlines the four priority areas. It has goals and that is what will be done to accomplish the priority area. And then there are strategies and that's how the goal will be achieved. And each of those strategies will have a work plan. And as I mentioned, that work plan is going to be a living document that um, will be flexible. Uh, next slide. The, uh, the the four basic uh, the four priority areas. Um, let's just talk a little bit about each of those quickly. Um, priority area number one is basic needs, and that is for housing, for health, and also um, affordability. Next. Staying mobile is about uh, transportation as well as infrastructure to ensure that older adults um, can get from where they live to where they need to be. So once they're there, also having age-friendly uh, infrastructure. So that includes um, connected communities. Next, building relationships. 
Um, this one we changed a little bit from the 2017 plan. Uh, we feel that we need to build, as Age Friendly Peterborough, we need to build relationships within those organizations and businesses um, to create more collaboration and foster partnerships. So that one now uh, includes uh, age friendly business, um, an intergenerational, more safety, so collaborative services coming together to support the safety of older adults, and also um, civic engagement, which is through volunteerism and uh, employment. Next. The fourth priority area is learning and contributing. Um, so it's how the, the older adults can be involved in our community. And so learning about what's available, so through different communication um, methods, uh, recreation, lifelong learning, volunteerism, um, and also um, part, being part of the community. Next. So this is uh, the work plan. This is a draft and an old version of it, but just so that you can see what the work plan will look like. Oh, at the top here, we have the priority area for this example is learning and contributing. Um, it states the outcome, the goal, and the strategy. And then this one being about volunteerism. So for example, we have a new organization um, in the greater Peterborough area called Volunteer Peterborough. So their action would be to develop their website, um, which is a matching portal. So if everyone who's interested in volunteering goes on the website, they can, they can um, look, they can see what opportunities are available that meet their skills and interests. So there'll be a list of tasks in order to make sure that website happens and communication. Um, Volunteer Peterborough is the lead. Uh, there's other partners involved in that initiative. Um, the, the website was just released, so that's part of the timelines. We've applied for funding. We were um, not successful in that particular funding, but we have received other funding now. Um, and then we're looking at measuring the objectives and the outcomes so that the, at the end of every year, when an organization or municipality puts an action on the work plan, at the end of every year, they will uh, provide their measurement. So uh, for example, this example with the website, how many people visited the website, so how many clicks were received, et cetera. So that's something that we can benchmark year over year. And then at the end of the plan, which will be in 2027, um, so at the end of every year, there'll be an impact report. And at the end of in 2027, we will do another uh, report card as we did this time and then move into a new plan. So that's how um, it will work for the next uh, five years. So the next plan, next steps are for the plan to be a catalyst. Sorry, thank you for next. Uh, Next slide. Um, so the plan will be a catalyst for community action and change. So through that, um, talking to older adults continuously, so we continue to listen to what their needs are and incorporate their voices into our actions. So we're asking each municipality to continue to do, uh, to do that. Next slide. So as projects continue to evolve, um, we will become closer as a community for Peterborough to be a thriving region that's inclusive, respectful, and accessible to people of all ages and abilities. Next slide. And um, for our next steps um, for uh, the municipality of Trent Lakes and, and uh, a council and, and staff and community, um, one is for Council today to receive the AFP report card 2017 to 22. Um, we are asking that you approve the Age Friendly Peterborough Community Action Plan for 2023 to 2027. And what that means is once all the municipalities, you are, num I have, uh, you are number six of eight. My last one is on October the 3rd. So once all of the municipalities have approved the plan, um, it will indicate that on the, on the, at the beginning of the community action plan. And then that plan will be printed and it will be available on the age friendly website. So we're asking that you approve that plan um, today. 
then um, at, over time, so supporting projects that contribute to an age-friendly community, looking at those goals and strategies and how can um, Trent Lakes municipality of, of staff and community help to become more age friendly. And then um, as I showed on the work plan, reporting on those successes uh, annually. Next slide. Um, and that is um, just a quick overview of uh, the report card and the plan and how we can work together to become more age friendly. And through you, Mr. Chair, I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Does anyone on council have any questions or comments? Go ahead, Councillor Francis. Just one question through the mayor. Um, uh, do you work in coordination with the city of Fourth Lakes? Uh, there's a large portion of the population that borders the, that, that, uh, that municipality and uses a lot of their services. No, we we technically don't. Um, there are many age friendly uh, age friendly communities that we do um, collaborate, learn best practices from. Um, or we are in conversations of, but technically, age friendly Peterborough is um, focusing on the eight, uh, greater Peterborough area. Okay. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Thank you, Mary Lamson. Um, thanks very much, Shane. Very comprehensive. Uh, one comment, one question. The comment is just to expand on your, your profile of uh, older, <laughs> using that word, adults in Trent Lakes. 32% um, you're right are over 65. If you dig deeper, 45% are over 60. And our median age is 58. So we're old. And as you pointed out, sadly, <laughs> going older. Um, so that's the comment. So this is really important work and appreciate all that you're doing. The question is, I, I was kind of looking, I, I have to admit, I only scanned through all of the reports, but I was looking for a report card. I was kind of looking for, for the last five years, how well have you done A, B, C, D on each of the four objectives? And I was kind of looking for what percentage of your actions have been completed. So I was looking for an actual report card that assessed how well you accomplished what you set out to do. I know there's lots of qualitative discussion about things that you have done, but I was looking for a more quantitative assessment of how did you do? <laughs> Were you successful? What grade would you give yourself? And of, of all of your actions, how many of them were actually completed? Great question, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was our first plan. So when it was released in 2017, we were actually Peterborough Council on Aging. And one of those recommendations was that we rebrand as age-friendly Peterborough. And therefore, there was discussions with the city and the county to create a, um, an age-friendly coordinator position. So that took a number of years to happen, and I wasn't hired until 2019. So between 2017 and 19, there were still the volunteer groups who were working on initiatives, but there wasn't an evaluation strategy. So it wasn't until I was hired and uh, was familiar and worked with the community organizations. So we did put out an impact report, um, but it was only for between 2020 to 2023. So during that time was COVID and things changed. So we did not want to, um, if somebody was listed in the plan as having a uh, uh, a project to do and they did not do that, we did not want to indicate they got an F because that, that project was not completed, um, especially during COVID. So therefore, that's why we listed what we did do. We interviewed all of those stakeholders and if something wasn't done, what was going to be done to car be carried over into our 2023 plan. And that's also why in the, in the 2023 plan, there are measurements embedded in the work plan. So we're in a much better position now to be able to report on those. And then after five years, be able to do a true uh, report card with a, with a grade. Does that help you, Deputy Mayor? Yeah, no, it does. Thank you. I, 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 
I still would have liked to have seen an assessment. I think we all understand COVID through everything. It's going to be chaos. But nonetheless, you know, if you had 100 and however many actions, how many did you actually complete? Because if you don't have a starting point for this one, then it's hard to also measure your new actions. Um, but I appreciate the, the explanation. Thank you. And I'm glad to see there's a strategy going forward. Any other questions for Jane? Go ahead, Councillor Greenberg. Thank you through you, Mayor, and thank you very much, Jane, and, and I think uh, Mayor Lamb said I, I saved uh, all my speaking to this topic, so I, I apologize in advance, uh, Jane. Uh, I'm just going to cover uh, a few items uh, in the document that I reviewed. Um, one of them was, uh, it mentions in one of the bullet points, uh, Peterborough is one of the five locations in Canada pilot the inter intergenerational home share program. Uh, so uh, I was wondering what uh, were the stats of the program and, and where are the other four locations in Canada and what were the results? Uh, were there successes and challenges and, and whatnot? Number of participants, number of students and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, th and this can probably be followed up after uh, via email um, if you don't have that uh, re readily available. Um, also in one of the uh, bullet points uh, uh, you mentioned or the report mentions the Abbey Field uh, uh, development, uh, and one in particular that's uh, being developed in Lakefield. And, and I had the uh, privilege of listening to uh, Deputy Mayor Ron Black of Selwyn at the Eastern Ontario Municipal uh, Conference um, as to their progress, as to the, um, the origins of, of that uh, development and their progress. And, and what uh, the key takeaways for me from that um, when I'm thinking about our Trent Lakes and our aged population and whatnot, and and how uh, you know the the phrase "age in place" is uh, thrown around uh, uh, quite often. Uh, the key takeaway was the affordability aspect, uh, whereas a rental fee, including food, capped out at approximately 2,300 per month uh, per resident. And I, and I believe the Development, the Abbey Field development in Lakefield is 16 units uh, uh, that requires approximately four acres of land. And I, I see that as, um, you know, the fact that our aging community in Trent Lakes uh, would have the opportunity to remain in their municipality, coupled with the fact that uh, the residences our seniors move out of creates a vacancy in the housing market. Uh, I see that as a positive on on both fronts. So it's a, it's a good opportunity that uh, I think uh, moving forward that our uh, municipality should uh, research at very least. Um, and I'll, I'll let you uh, respond before I go into my last comment, uh, uh, Jane. Sure, great. I'll respond to your first one about uh, an update on the intergenerational home share program. Um, Canada Home Share experienced some issues with the process. It was a very comprehensive process that required um, both the, the person who would be renting and the the renter to complete about 300 questions and the whole matching process and so they they did not have many matches um in peterborough for example we did have one um in mississauga uh they had zero um they had i think two in uh vancouver um and toronto where it started for the first pilot it did well and then the second time um not as as well so uh they've gone back to redo what they were doing and so they um the two staff who worked for the canada home share have now joined forces with another individual so they are called uh, spaces shared um, and we're in collaboration, so Age Friendly Peterborough um, and Fleming College, we've been in conversations with them about uh, bringing them to Peterborough. So uh, we're hoping to, to start that in January. Um, then there's also another organization, um, and so that one, the, the Spaces Shared, it still has that um, component of matching. Uh, whereas uh, Rent for Students is another website that um, Fleming College has an agreement with, um, and people can post if you're if you're. It's not just older adults, but if you're.
who would like to rent a room to a student, you can post on that website and it's the students that know that they can go on there. So you do your matching uh, yourself with resources that are provided. So that's, uh, I hope that answers the intergenerational home share question. Um, then that does tie into the next answer with uh, affordable housing for older adults and home share um, is becoming a more appealing uh, because not only for financial reasons but also for safety um, and organizations uh, like uh, senior women living together and that started in the greater Peterborough area and it is now a provincial organization and it is a matching so women create profiles and they find accommodations together um, and it's, it's, it has been very, very successful. Um, so looking at what our spaces are, this is really, um, there's, a, there's a lot of examples. So for example, in Kingston, they had, there's the Kinsman um, Seniors area where there's small houses and there's a row house. There's six in a row, but there's a number of these in a community. So it's just looking at our space, um, looking at buildings like schools and how can we repurpose them for um, older for whole, uh, housing, not just for older adults, but for intergenerational housing as well. One other thing I'll mention too are they're called NORCs, Naturally Occurring Retirement Communities. And that is our apartment buildings or condos where more than 50% of the residents are older adults that is happening more and more and so we're looking at providing some services in those NORC locations we've identified 20 um, in the greater Peterborough area and working with them to provide some services where where they live Very good. I think you have one more question <laughs> thank you through you Mary thank you for your indulgence um, Thanks very much, Jane. Uh, my last uh, point is um, I reviewed the WHO's uh, Global Strategy and Action Plan on Aging and Health, which is the 2016 to 2020, uh, and the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And in both, uh, the predominant reference is to that of development in cities. Uh, the new urban agenda that is mentioned states it provides a pathway for reinforcing the relationship between urbanization, aging, and sustainable development, and hence age-friendly urban developments. Uh, being part of the, uh, the Seniors Luncheon Club, I've had uh, many conversations with our seniors uh, who are concerned that they will be forced or left no alternative but to move to an urban center. Uh, given that both yours and the province's age-friendly Ontario Communities Network is heavily based on the WHO's framework. What assurances are provided for in your 2023 to 2027 action plan that will ease concerns that the eventuality will be that our aging population will be left with no alternative but to move to an urbanized development such as Peterborough, Peterborough or elsewhere? Uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, um, fabulous question because uh, we expected when we got the Stats Canada 2021, we expected the number of older adults to actually decrease in the rural areas, but they actually increased. And North Kawartha has the highest with 35% um, of their population being over the age of 65. So them being even farther from um, urban areas. And so uh, this, the services locally um, does need to be addressed. We do have our, our community care offices um, who provide services for rural. We have also just this year um, have been developing hubs. So there's a number of hubs um, in the rural communities where service providers can meet with clients um, so that they can come if the service provider or organization is based out of the city of Peterborough, they can meet clients um, in rural areas. So that is one example of something that we are um, trying to increase. Plus, we're looking at not only, well, community care is a, is a best practice and they are based on uh, volunteer. So however, we as a community, how can we improve their service and decrease their waiting lists by engaging more volunteers to assist. 
So the more volunteers we have, for example, with driving, um, then in each of the communities to drive people, if there are services in Peterborough and transportation is an issue, getting them to, um, to those appointments would be something that we can work on as a community. So those are, that's just a couple of examples, but we're very aware of uh, the needs of older adults in rural communities and what the barriers are. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you through, Mayor. Uh, this is the last point, I promise, Jane. Um, seeing that uh, North Quarta has the highest uh, aging percentage and our uh, Trent Lakes is the second highest, um, what I was hoping to see in the uh, in the action plan was was more specifics uh, as to uh, I guess our demographic and our, our geographic location as far as um, uh, whether it be infrastructure and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it does seem like it's urban centric uh, the the report. So uh, I would have liked to have seen something more. Uh, whether it had to be separated into two separate uh, categories, that one being city of Peterborough, or it's urbanized uh, and um, in a different category, dealing specifically with uh, our regions being North Kortha, uh, Trent Lakes and, and other uh, rural uh, areas. Um, so but thank you, uh, thank you for your presentation. Go Go ahead, Councillor Franzen. Yeah, just, just for further comment, uh, I, I, uh, through the mayor, I do believe, like John does, that this is uh, a, a great program for urban areas. I see it less a, an advantage to Trent Lakes as 25 to 30 percent of our population would be looking to get right and uh, uh, combine with uh, some of the neighborhoods that they're close to in city of the Quartha Lakes. And uh, I was dealing with an elderly lady a number of years ago when I was on council and uh, she couldn't afford the 80 cents a kilometer that uh, community care charge to take her to the hospital for treatment. Through through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I would I would like to address the the last uh, two two comments, and the the plan is developed in a way that is very high level. So, for example, you know, I've just opened up a page to uh, goal 4.2, which is support and increase access to leisure, recreation, and social activities that promote a better quality of life. And so, that being a high level statement. Um, the hope is to work with the organizations in Trent Lake and the staff from the municipality on how they are going to um, support that particular goal. So one being, you know, st strategy is promote the benefits. So that's something if, if uh, Age Friendly Peterborough creates a chip sheet or, the, or uh, that, that it can be circulated through um, the website, the, the municipality website, et cetera, um, and through social clubs already existing. Well, Age Friendly Peterborough will work with the local organizations and staff, um, go through the plan and to uh, look for gaps of what's not happening and we can support them on, on to how it can happen. Thank you very much for your comments. I think it's maybe incumbent upon us to try to work with that plan and make it develop in a more rural part for both North Forth and Trent Lakes. I know transportation in this community is a bit difficult, so I think we need to expand some of our transportation routes that exist in short firms now. So I think we can work towards that, some best practices. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation, Jane. Any other comments or questions? I'm seeing none. I think we have recommendations on a, on a motion that we will look at if anyone's prepared to make such a motion. Go ahead, Councilor Perry. Through you, Mayor, I'd uh, like to make a motion to receive, but uh, I'm just a little reluctant on approving it. Um, and I know um, Jane had mentioned that it's it's high level um, from where I used to work, high level net general like a general umbrella 
Um, I just don't want to get, uh, I don't want our um, municipality to get caught into a scenario where um, it's so general that uh, it can fit into any category and that sort of thing. So, so I'm, I'm willing to uh, the motion to receive uh, and I don't know if I can get some input from other councillors. Councilman, anyone else want to go ahead now? Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Uh, I will support the motion. I I agree with with Don. It's a little premature, I think, for us to be approving the plan. So we really can't identify specifically the impact on our municipality. Is that a motion, Councilor Brim? That is a motion. That is a motion to receive the, the presentation. Yes. Do I have a second for that motion? That that. Okay, that is a second. Any other conversation? I, I just want to comment. I, I agree with both uh, Deputy Mayor and Councillor that uh, that's the route that we should go. Okay, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much, Jane, for your report. And we look forward to for further communication. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jane. Bye bye. Okay, we can move on now to item nine of our agenda, which is delegations. And we have item 9.1 is Bob Taylor Fraser. Can you please come up and start your delegation? Well, well thank you, Marilyn. Ann said it. <clears throat> Good afternoon, member of council and staff, the ones that are in the room and the ones that are on the line. It's kind of great to be back in person. Um, I'm going to be speaking to agenda item 10.4.1, uh, next slide. I'm going to focus on three points today. Uh, first, the quality of the staff report that you will all be receiving and, and reviewing in a few minutes, the intent of the staff recommendation, and to propose supplementary recommendations for the terms of reference for uh, a heritage advisory committee, including both scope and objectives and composition. Next slide. I ran this report by some other, some others, archivists, colleagues, including the two most active members of PRCAC, uh, Bill Kent and Sheila Perry. Adele Arbor produced a first class, high quality, comprehensive and understandable report. And her efforts highlight the extensive expertise of staff on a complex and largely unknown area. The report portrays the complexities of built heritage initiatives, which are highly regulated and subject to the occasional political whim. It defines clearly the governance challenges, specifically the difference between a heritage advisory committee and a municipal heritage committee. And it comes to a logical conclusion and pathway that an HAC precedes an MHC. And it recognizes the significant financial impacts of planning, startup, and ongoing administrative and project costs. Next slide. So let's put this into, into context. Based on PRCAC's environmental scan of heritage initiatives, both structured and unstructured, in Peterborough County and across Ontario, we identified four themes. One, to celebrate the municipality of Trent Lake's unique cultural identity and provide access to culture for all, including academic and personal research. Let's emphasize uniqueness and accessibility. To preserve and develop cultural and creative places and spaces, to invest in local culture and build cultural leadership, and to preserve, protect, and enhance our heritage and institutional memory. Next slide. We have two recommendations for you, for your consideration. First, that the terms are referenced for a heritage advisory committee be expanded to include in the scope and objectives, the goal of a cultural resources action plan encompassing all three aspects of heritage built cultural and natural resources. Next slide. We use the term action plan deliberately. There are a number of strategic plans in motion in Trent Lakes today. 
We could argue, we would argue, that what is needed is not another strategic plan, but a tactical, priority-based, and action-based plan. The recommendation uh, has an emphasis on built heritage, and this is fully understood. It responds to the direction of council. Nonetheless, there is a need for all three components of heritage to be addressed at the same time to ensure appropriate prioritization of key milestones, to identify interrelated aspects of all three. For example, the interrelationship between cultural and natural resources in the, in the form of our cemeteries, and to leverage off plans in other municipalities and provincial and federal agencies. And it also reinforces PRCAC's original recommendation Next slide. Here are two examples of key milestone activities. One is a heritage register of designated properties and properties that have not yet been designated but are believed to be of cultural heritage value or significance. This is clearly laid out in the report as a key step. Second, but second, in the interest of inclusivity and long-term planning, an actionable plan that identifies and prioritizes all three aspects of heritage based on major and minor projects, resources required, potential new or expanded facilities, the financial infrastructure, and short, medium, and long-term opportunities. Next slide. This second recommendation requires an adjustment in the drafting of a terms of reference, especially committee composition. The recommendation has two components. One, subject matter experts be consulted in the drafting of the terms of reference. And second, thought be given to membership of an HAC that is not restricted to residents. Next slide. The key question is not why, but what is needed to achieve success. The complexities of this plan can be simplified into an actionable plan using external resources, resulting in streamlined processes, use of successful implementation tools elsewhere, and the maximization of experience. It means a comprehensive business plan that's supporting all initiatives can be produced based on the experience of others, including in-depth knowledge of financial opportunities and challenges. Opportunities for concurrent activities can be identified leveraging off available collaborative programs at Trent University and Sri Sanford Fleming College. This does not replace, this supplements in-house expertise in a collaborative and to some degree energized process. It helps to prepare a workable roadmap for the future and it allows for objective feedback driving priorities and challenges. Next slide. I'd like to spend some time on this chart because we consider this essential. To leverage the professional expertise and experience of the following as both voting and or adjunct members of an advisory committee. The Ontario Heritage Trust and the National Trust of Canada because they both have extensive expertise in all heritage matters, in all three heritage matters. The Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada which sets the standard for designation criteria. As Adele knows, it's a, it's a small 85-page document. But it's pretty exhaustive. The Ontario Historical Society, because they have professional resources in historical interpretation. The heritage planners in both the county and the city who have hands-on experience uh, at, a, at a municipal level in all heritage matters. Cultural and historical geographers who will lend academic credibility this, to this process, professional archivists, because they are the ones that develop collection, organization, and access management policies and procedures. The local historical societies were appropriate, not just in Trent Lakes, but beyond, who understand the practical challenges of heritage. Indigenous knowledge workers were critical for integrating indigenous perspectives into this program and museum curatorial and management professionals because museum management is a specific skill set. 
Next slide. In conclusion, the report sets an important foundation for built heritage initiatives. The complexity of heritage preservation and conservation requires an integrated, inclusive, and financially sustainable approach. And we suggest a new action-based tactical approach to defining and resourcing an advisory committee where professional expertise is a huge component. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm only too willing to try to answer them. Thank you very much for your presentation. Anyone have any questions of Bob? Okay, Tiffany Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Mary Lynch. Thanks a lot, Bob. I know a lot of Bob went into this uh, into this presentation uh, and appreciate your own expertise in this area. I have two questions. The first one, because uh, it's not my area of expertise, I'm not really sure about natural resources. <laughs> I certainly understand built uh, and cultural uh, heritage. Natural resources, to me, starts to spill over into land use planning, environmental uh, protection, and other things. So I'm, I just need some help in understanding how it would fit under um, the Heritage Advisory Committee, as opposed to fitting other places or overlapping with other activities. So maybe it's just an education process that I need. Because I think of natural resources, trees, water, streams, wetlands, I don't know, extent to birds, fish. Um, so I, I, I just don't know how that fits in. Well, you have to put boundaries around it, but let me give you, let me use Nogi's Creek Cemetery as an example. That's a natural resource heritage site. Because it's land, as you say, that has been changed by man. So the definition, and I'll, I'll, I'll support me or, or correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, typically that is what's called a cultural landscape. And that's where culture and natural resources merge. This would not be an attempt to preserve every, every PSW in the, in the county or, or forest or canopies. That's not, uh, that's different. This is the cultural landscape aspect of heritage. Okay, that helps. Thank you. I, I think we do have to put boundaries around it when we consider terms of reference. So that's helpful to me. The second question, and I think you said it, because um, you said uh, about all those resource organizations, they could be voting and or ad, adjunct uh, members. And I guess I would see the flexibility of having experts who are not residents be either uh, resources to committees as adjunct members, you know, and or you could change the definition for a committee member not to be a resident. But I think I just I'm hoping you'd be supportive of they they contribute to the committee <laughs> and we need them because we need their expertise, whether they're members or resources or adjunct, I think is less important um, than the fact that we bring in their expertise and leverage it and use it in both developing and implementing our plan. Uh, to, to Mr. Mayor, to, to Deputy Mayor Armstrong, absolutely. Um, I think that the danger is <clears throat> that the majority of the players on the committee do not understand the big picture heritage. Um, and I'm going to use BRCAC as an example. We're at a point in time, we didn't have that. And it cost us in terms of getting ahead of the job. Um, we, it, it, to me, uh, the, the, those names that I put down on that list, they're the ones that had the experience in having done this before. So in their experience, what is the best fit on such an advisory committee that incorporates expertise, but at the same time has it at arm's length in an advisory role. I, I think it's like anything else in terms of reference, you go to the best minds to figure out what the best path is. That would be my, now I did want to uh, say one more thing about, because I, I mentioned this to you before the meeting, 
about the collaborative efforts with Trent. I'm going to give an example of something um, that you may or may not be aware of, but there is a center for community-based research at Trent. The way it works <laughs> is that the municipality, whether it be through an advisory committee or staff, would go to Trent and pitch an idea. The idea would then be farmed out and four or five students that were interested would apply to be part of it. This is a credit course. They're not doing this as volunteers, they're doing it for mm -hmm. academic stature. They would be supervised by a, a, a member of the faculty, which gives it almost immediate, at least if it's a good cultural geographer, uh, academic credibility, which I think is really, really important. The costs, there would be, there might be out-of-pocket costs, but there is a fund at Trent called the Simons Trust Fund for Canadian Studies that could have an application made to it to underwrite these other out-of-pocket costs. In other words, this whole job could be free. Not cost the township anything, it would be arm's length because they would just go away and do their job and come back and it's all done. At the same time, obviously, interfacing considerably with both Vidal and Barbara as, as required. I just wanted to, to give you an idea of, of how those external ex, that external expertise can bring something that can make this process go at an optimal rate. So, go ahead, if you are. Follow up, Wendy. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mayor Lamb said, thanks, Bob. That's that's interesting information. We need to tuck away. Um, I just wanted to say that I think we both violently agree on vetting committee applicants to ensure that they have expertise and knowledge in the area and not just time on their hands and a willingness, which is great, you know, time on their hands and a willingness to support volunteers is terrific. But on our committees, I think we really do need people with the background and expertise to uh, to move those particular ones forward in whatever capacity they serve on the committee. So I think we're violently agreeing on that. <laughs> Can you go ahead, Tom? Sure, you, Mayor. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, I, I'm with uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Armstrong as far as it's out of my area of expertise. So thank you for that, and thank you, Adele, as well. Um, just a, a question. Uh, it, it may apply, it, it may not. Uh, how do you assure that uh, our uh, local residents, our generational and, and general residents, um, have input into this uh, PRCAC of this new? sort of, uh, I guess, uh, proposed uh, building of the uh, the PRCAC uh, advisory committee. How do they come into it? I know we'll have representation from the experts, subject matter experts. How do, how do they fit in, if you will? Well, I would probably be recommending uh, as one of the action steps for the advisory committee to hold focus groups at each of the community centers um, and not just at the community centers but outside the boundaries of the township. There are hundreds of people that have cottages that live in Peterborough and the GTA. Uh, they too need a voice in this, not so we'll get people in Galway, Cavendish, and Harvey where they live, and then get people outside of the township where they live too. And that way we build a comprehensive collaborative uh, research project. Um, that's how I'd handle that. Great, thanks so much. Any other comments? I just have one. I, I think that leveraging expertise both inside and outside of our community is so important we have such a wide variety of people that are probably ready and the right fit for a heritage advisory committee right in our own com community and, and, and around our community i think it's very important to leverage that and i think you know with some of your comments there that there's possibility that, that universities and colleges can get involved to help augment their education it is such a great part of all of that i think it's a, a fantastic idea thank you okay any other comments I thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. I will entertain a motion to receive. I see.
Councilor Graber for a mover and Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much, Bob Sellerays. Okay, we can move on to item 9.2 of our agenda. We may have to wake Matthew up back there. I think he's okay now. We're good. You can please come and do your presentation or delegation. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And hello to members of council and staff. Uh, my name is Matthew Milligan. I'm senior advisor for real estate and government relations at Bell, Bell Mobility. And um, here today to talk to you about the matter that's on the agenda regarding CRINs. Uh, CRINs is the organization that you use to um, for the review and approval of telecommunications sites currently. Uh, next slide, please. Or do I move this myself? Or? There we go. Just a few words on um, how towers are are typically are regulated in Canada. Um, the review of telecommunication sites uh, differs from most planning matters in how the municipality or how they're reviewed in uh, most municipalities, and that's because towers are federally regulated. They're not subject to zoning bylaws or official plans, um, and this is this is regulated by ISED. ISED is the department known um, as the acronym. Uh, the full name is Industry, Science and Economic, Economic Development Canada. It's commonly known though as, as ISED. With that said, everyone recognizes, certainly ISED does and, 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 uh, and Bell certainly recognized that the experts when it comes to land use planning are, are here at the municipality. Planning that's done, done locally, I'll, 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 at the end of the day, the experts are, are here at, uh, um, within this council chamber or within this organization. Um, so you are the experts as to what's appropriate and what's not for your for your municipality. And prior to um, constructing a new tower site, I said requires Bell or any proponent for that matter to go to the, um, the to the municipality after consulting with the appropriate stakeholders and either obtaining well really obtaining a statement of concurrence. And this municipality may choose to provide that statement of concurrence, or they might provide a statement of non-concurrence indicating that the proposal was not accepted. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to protocols, um, there's generally two options. There is a default protocol, and that protocol is always in place. It's in effect in any municipality that does not have a protocol in place. Um, so if a municipality that has not developed a protocol, I said has a default um, protocol. It sets out how the public should be consulted. It sets out what those consulting, uh, um, what the consulting framework looks like. Uh, what it lacks, though, is um, information for the proponent as to what's preferable as far as locations, types of land use, um, important, um, uh, important. let's say, for example, uh, a scenic uh, attribute of the municipality to avoid or something that's very sensitive to the municipality. But the ISED protocol is in place and it does provide a framework or structure to allow for a public consultation to take place. The other option is is one that uh, look, appears with the municipality that would uh, is going with this, and that is um, a council adopted protocol, and they take all different types of forms. Generally, though, there's a lot of guidance within the protocol as to what's appropriate, and it's uh, much easier for a proponent to know what uh, when lo when trying to locate a site um, as to what uh, what may be uh, of um, be looked at favorably by council or planning committee, whoever it might be, when it comes time to allow, ask for approval of that. Um, this is typically done, uh, there's always public consultation when it comes to any tower site. Certainly there is for a council adopted protocol. This could be a written consultation. Um, almost always though, it should, there's some sort of public uh, component to it. That could be a public meeting, an open house, or sometimes it's a bit of, a bit of both. Both, both processes, according to ISED's, uh, ISED's uh, directive to municipalities, are to be completed with 120 days, to, um, and that was from the, the time the application submitted to, to the end. Next uh, slide, please. So the municipality does have a current protocol, and that is the CRINS protocol. When, um, when the municipality signed up to use CRINS as their, the agency to review telecommunication site applications, it came along with a protocol. And um, the challenge that we have with the with, with CRINs is ultimately has well, there's a few things. The first one is timing. Uh, generally it takes one to two years to get uh, 
to see an application through it's from start to finish we don't feel that after that's been completed there's one to two years of of um of value that's been added to a to a telecommunication site application and uh, that's certainly a challenge for us as far as you know determining when we could build a site how long it might take to to go through the municipal approval uh process um so that's certainly one of the challenges but right now uh, current is in we think that they're in flux it's difficult to even get a response out of them um, we have submitted an application to Crins for an application in this mis municipality, which I'll get into in a moment, and it's, we have not had a response from them. Um, we understand that uh, staff is, will be bringing a new um, protocol for council's recommendation or consideration, I should say, very soon. And I'm here to say today to tell you that certainly we support you in removing Crins from as your as the agency that reviews your sites. We'd much rather deal with you, um, you as council and your staff when it comes to citing uh, telecommunication sites. It allows us to have a two-way dialogue if there's any questions that come up about what's appropriate or what's not. If there's something, if you have a protocol that is in place and we need some interpretation of, of it, you know, we know where to go, we would go to your, your, your planning staff. Uh, we're right now, uh, we're dealing with an organization that's not in this municipality, has no knowledge of this municipality, and right now it is difficult or impossible to even get a hold of. So uh, bottom line is yes, we do support you in this and certainly look forward um, if, the, if that is the decision that you make, uh, to start, start working with you directly on telecommunication sites. Now, we do have an application, one application in to uh, the municipality through the CRINS uh, portal. It's a site that's certainly very important to us, and we think it should be very important to anyone in the municipality, and that is because it's a replacement site. It's a replacement site for the tower that we, uh, that we operate currently at Flynn's Corner. The existing tower at Flynn's Corner can no longer provide service beyond March 31st, 2024. This is due to a uh, leasehold issue. The lease is expiring there. And we, ha we do have a replacement site uh, proposed at 1625 um, Highway 507. So that is just north of there. And this is the application that we have made through through CRINS, your, uh, the consultant that currently is in place to, um, to review these applications. Uh, we have not received an acknowledgement at this point that's a bit unusual but um it is in place and uh, we understand staff has have had, have had a challenge as well and at least last time we spoke to uh, staff and getting uh, um information on the application that we we did we submit uh, that we submitted at the time so in um in an effort to minimize service interruptions and to um, to mobile and wireless home internet users it is definitely imperative that this application be uh, processed as soon as possible so that we can start consulting the public, learning about any issues that the municipality might have uh, so that we can ensure that uh, they're making an attempt anyway to, uh, to try to uh, have uninterrupted coverage in this area of the, of the municipality. Next slide here. And just, um, just so everyone's aware, the potential impact of, of uh, an interruption service of this area would be would be felt largely on the north end of Big Falls Lake. Um, also, Edwina Drive and Kennedy Drive, those are two streets that uh, roads that uh, come down from Highway 36 to Big Falls Lake that are, uh, I'd say, heavily populated um, compared to other areas around that. Um, Highway 36 between Crow's Line Road and Fire Route 81. Um, and also, um, and that would be for mobile, largely for mobile users. There are a few people and businesses along there, but largely for mobile users, that area would be um, problematic. And then also Highway 507 between Highway 36 and Mississauga Dam Road. Now there are other cell sites in this municipality, and if you're at the edge of you know, some of these areas I've just mentioned, you may benefit from, from uh, the services provided by another tower site. But generally, if you're in the middle of these areas, will be could potentially be problematic. And as a result of that, we would like to ultimately get on with this consultation so that we can determine if um, uh, sooner rather than later if an appropriate site at these locations is appropriate um, and whether council would con concur with that. Um, I will mention that Rogers also co-locates on this this tower as well so any interruption to service uh, for Bell would also impact Rogers customers as well. Next slide please. So moving forward, I know we have. A, I know that the municipality is considering a new protocol, or plans to anyway, on October 2nd. That will be the next council meeting from now. And that's only two weeks from now, which 
under normal circumstances would be, you know, why not just wait two weeks? But what I would like to suggest to council and and uh, ultimately up to you, but you know, there are two other ways that we could move forward uh, um, now potentially. Uh, one would be using the default protocol that's in place by ISED. Um, um, actually, I guess that's on the next page here. Sorry about that. I just want to go to the next page. The default protocol from ISED um, has a written public consultation. It sets out that members of the public that own property within three times tower height, um, that would be about uh, 400 and that'd be about 360 meters, would be contacted and uh, offered an opportunity to comment in writing on the proposal. It also sets out that the proponent would set um, would put a newspaper notice in the local newspaper and allow for, for comment on that. Um, this would be automatically, well, certainly any municipality doesn't have a protocol, it would be in effect. And it would also be in effect um, in this municipality if it was to suspend its, the current protocol that it has. I'm sorry, if you go, go back one slide, and I meant to mention this first, I just, I could just go back one slide. The other option that we would propose is if council was so willing to propose a temporary protocol. Temporary protocol would only apply to one specific site for this specific purpose. It would be a formal application that's submitted by Bell to the municipality. Bell would send out notice to local residents um, owning property within 400 meters of the subject property um, and provide invitation to a public meeting to be held in the council ch chamber. A notice of the public meeting would also be put in the local newspaper. Uh, Bell to make presentation in council chamber to local residents of council, just as we've seen um, today. Um, some of the public meetings that you have. And at the conclusion of the meeting, the municipality would either review the request, or could review the request for concurrence, uh, defer if additional information is required, or, or if additional time is required. Um, now we set that out. Um, I know in, in speaking with staff, the staff um, was not wild about the concept of using I Industry Canada's, or I'm sorry, ISA's default process. Uh, so I thought we'd set that out. Uh, as I understand it, it, it would be uh, the proposed temporary pro pro uh, protocol would be more in keeping with uh, what's generally practiced in this municipality and as i understand it uh, might be also more in keeping with what staff might be proposing to you on october 2nd although with that said i have not i don't i've not seen the full details other than this is normally what it, what happens in this municipality is that uh, there's a public meeting that happens in this room in this council chamber in this type of in this meeting and um, members of the public are given an opportunity to comment um, get information and then provide an opinion whether they speaking for or against. Uh, that concludes um, my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to happy to take them from you. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew, for your presentation. Anyone on the council have any questions? Well, thank you, Councilor Braver. Thanks uh, to you, Mayor. Thanks very uh, much, uh, Mr. Mulligan, for that. Um, I just have a question, and I know I believe this is going to be addressed uh, 10.6.1 further in the agenda. Uh, just with regard to the 10.6.1, uh, is that going to sort of open the door for the dialogue uh, with which uh, Mr. Milligan presented the proposed protocols? So thank you and through you. So yes, staff have a report coming up and we can certainly have a further conversation and involve Adele in that as well. Um, and after you hear the recommendations of staff, if you want to do anything different, that could be an opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Matthew, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thanks very much. So this is kind of related, but not really, I'm going to slip it in. <laughs> it's a Bell, speak, speak Bell cell that. tower. Are there any uh, other plans in the works for additional cell towers within our municipality? Um, I Not at this time, no. We do not have anything else proposed other than this, this proposed, the, propo the replacement site at Flint's Corner. Are you open yep. to the possibility? We're certainly open to the possibility. Listen, uh, when I, I spent lots of time on the road into <laughs> communities such as yours, people always bring up the locations that um, that don't work well. Um, I travel through here all the time. I'm a conjurer in Halliburton. I certainly, you know, know where know where all, all the spots are that need improvement. That's for sure. But uh, certainly, if you know, if you want to reach out with uh, any information you might have, um, certainly staff have my uh, contact information, and certainly we'd love to hear from you. 
Great. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think that there has been many places been touched on by other organizations for locations. There has oh, been, I know. Much of that has gone on. <laughs> I think, uh, you. Sir Brandon, you had a yeah, uh, just uh, the replacement tower would be exactly the same as the tower that uh, currently. It would be, yes. Height, um, yes. Yeah. yeah, and the plan would be that the replacement tower would be built and then the, then the tower, the existing tower would be would be removed. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. Thanks for that, uh, Councillor Franz. And you, you, you raised a good question. I mean, is there any potential for having the new tower have a greater range and or a greater strength? Well, not a greater yeah. strength. Um, like 5G or whatever. Well, the new tower site would be five would be five G. Um, cell towers only go up to this is about as tall a cell tower as you're going to find in anywhere for that matter. Problem is, is that the Radio signal coming from the the, the base, the, the base shelter. By the time it gets to the, the, the top, diminishing returns kick in as far as the signal strength is concerned. There, I mean, much of the challenge. I mean, if you actually look to the the south of where this tower is, uh, there are a number of tower sites um, to the east to the west of Buckhorn. Um, there's a couple around uh, Deer Bay, uh, and then as you go north, the next one would be Ketchikoma, and um, the problem being the problem as you go north is you're under the Canadian Shield there. It's you know you need this is line of sight technology, and as soon as you as soon as you don't have line of sight with the tower, um, the the signal strength starts to drop significantly, and even the tree canopy has an has an impact on that as well. There, so just to answer your question, no, there's nothing really that can do to that we could do to provide more signal strength. I mean, we do look at optimizing tower sites from time to time by looking at the, where the antennas are pointed to. They are directional antennas. And in instances where, um, such as this site, where a tower site is um, lots has lots of area around it where um, no one's lived or no one's living or working or, or recreating, um, we'll often look to point antennas in, into to those locations. Uh, but um, Ultimately, you need more tower sites in order to provide coverage in areas where uh, where there is no uh, no, uh, no signal strength now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. I think second, maybe now to short-term rentals, Wi-Fi is probably one of the biggest questions all of us get yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah true enough. Um, just just a comment about there are other other providers on that tower, correct? And and they would be on the new tower. No, it's, it's just Rogers, and Rogers would be on the new tower. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. Sorry, through you, Mary. Just one final okay. comment. Um, I meant to mention, but uh, I think issues like this, uh, the issues with the cranes and whatnot, it's important that we you know, remove barriers, especially for uh, services that our municipality needs for health and safety and, and whatnot. It's like having running water for uh, for lack of better reference. In this day and age, everybody uh, is forced to use you know, cellular uh, technology and that sort of thing and any sort of barriers to that that should be a, a top priority so. yeah certainly we appreciate that and it's always it's always um, a bit concerning when we go to a municipality to ask a question about a tower siting and then we're asked to go talk to an organization that's not again not here has no knowledge um, has doesn't understand the lay of the land and uh, that's certainly not the, the case here but uh, um, it has certainly happened in the past, and uh, we'd much rather direct deal directly with uh, with your staff uh, first, and then ultimately, uh, I guess any any site's going to go to council. But we'd rather sort out any problems where we can with uh, with staff of the municipality where possible. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? I'm seeing none. Okay. Entertain a motion to receive that presentation. I see Councillor Franzen for a mover and Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much, Matthew Miller. Okay. We can now move on to staff item 10 of our agenda, which is staff report. 10.1 is public works. We have none. 10.2 recreation facilities, none. 10.3, fire and emergency services, none. 10.4, building and planning. 
we have 10.41, which is a Bell Arbor Art Planner. Would you like to speak with this item? Thank you. No. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Lambshead. Um, at the March 21st Council meeting, Council requested that staff report back regarding heritage designations within the municipality of Trent Lakes. And further to this resolution, Council at their July 11th meeting directed staff to prepare terms of reference for a heritage advisory committee. The report I prepared essentially describes the difference between a heritage advisory committee not functioning under the Ontario Heritage Act and a municipal heritage committee which functions under the Ontario Heritage Act. In preparation of this report, I acknowledge that there are many municipal documents that speak to the importance of culture and heritage resources in our community. And I've included specific policies or references of these various documents within the appendices of the report. Every community has its own unique culture and heritage. Cultural heritage is what we value from the past and what we want to preserve for future generations. In order, to, in order to be able to designate properties, the municipality must have a Municipal Heritage Committee established and functioning under the Ontario Heritage Act. The Ontario Heritage Act establishes many regulated timelines. For example, how long a property can remain on a municipal inventory, and the Act establishes a detailed process for designating a property of cultural heritage value or interest and that comes with a specific financial requirement from the municipality um, during budget in order to have the work done to go forward with a designation. At this time, um, under review by staff, we are recommending that a heritage advisory committee be established to determine the importance of heritage within the municipality and that further consideration be given in the future about establishing a municipal heritage committee under the Ontario Heritage Act. So what I'm essentially requesting is through the advisory committee, um, the committee will have a certain mandate, goals, et cetera, and they will determine and bring back to council what the interest is in the municipality and what our inventory would be of heritage uh, properties for designation. It's also important for council to acknowledge staff commitment, resources and time, which would be required with the establishment of both the Heritage Advisory Committee and the Municipal Heritage Committee. Therefore, I am recommending that council receive the report from the planner regarding municipal heritage designations and processes, and further that council direct staff to draft the terms of reference for a Heritage Advisory Committee which will include the development of an inventory of properties exhibiting cultural heritage value or interest as part of the scope. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Adele. Okay, anybody on council have any questions about it? Well, I'm seeing none. Anybody on council? Go, go ahead, Councillor Brady. Uh, I'm prepared to uh, make a motion uh, to receive the report and also the council direct staff to draft the terms of reference for a heritage advisory committee, which will include the development of an inventory of properties exhibiting cultural heritage value or interest as part of the scope. Thank you for your room. And I will uh, Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will make one comment. I think this is something that we've been needing for a long time. Uh, a couple of presentations that were presented at the PRCAC made me well aware that we are way behind the wheel on this. So we need to catch up. Thank you very much for that. And now I'll call for the vote. All in favor. That motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, we can now move on to item 10.4.2 of our agenda, which is the Harbor, our planner. Would you like to speak to that file? Yes, thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. This report is dealing with the removal of a folding symbol for Unit 35 in Oak Orchard. 
The property owners of Unit 35 in Oak Orchard plan a condominium have applied to remove the holding provision on their lands. The property owners are intending to construct a single detached dwelling on a vacant lot and have satisfied all conditions related to the removal of the hold, which includes the submission of an archaeological assessment, along with the ministry letter identifying that the assessment has been entered into the public register of archaeological reports. They have entered into a site plan agreement with the municipality and they have provided documentation to confirm engagement with Curve Lake First Nation in the preparation and finalization of the archaeological assessment. The notice of intention to pass, to pass an amending bylaw to remove the holding symbol was given in accordance with section 36 of the Planning Act. Planning staff are supportive of the removal of the holding provision on Unit 35 and recommend that Council receive this report and support the approval of the bylaw to remove the holding symbol for Unit 35, which is on today's Council agenda for consideration. Thank you very much, Adele. Anyone have any comments, questions over there? No comments. Seeing none, is anyone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Franzen, go ahead. I'll make a motion in support to receive the report and uh, follow the recommendations. Yes. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Deputy Mayor Armstrong. With a comment, if I may, and that is it's very nice to see the process that uh, our staff set up a long time ago in Oak yeah. Shores working so smoothly and uh, moving right along. So appreciate yes. the work that was done to set this up. Thank you very much. We'll call for the vote. All in favor? The motion has carried. Thank you very much. Okay, now we can move on to item 10.4.3 of our agenda. And I believe Sarah Villamarker is going to speak to this item. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. On today's agenda, there's a municipal appraisal form for consent files B-17-23, B-18-23, B-19-23, and B-2023, uh, pardon me. Uh, it's been submitted by agent Aditya Sernivas of EcoVu Consulting on behalf of the property owner 241913 Ontario Incorporated. The subject land is located on a vacant piece of land along County Road 36. Application B-17-23 does not conform to the Trent Lakes official plan nor the municipality's comprehensive zoning bylaw. This particular proposal requires much more than a limited extension of the or extension, pardon me, of the existing private road in order to gain legal access to the subject lands as described in the Trent Lakes official plan section 6.2.1.4.2. Additionally, the access to this particular lot would involve the creation of a new right of way rather than extending the existing fire route. Part of the proposed access to the subject lands are proposed to encroach and disturb identified wetland features, as mentioned in the applicant's environmental impact study. The proposal would create a lot reflective of a back lot or secondary tiered development, which is not permitted under section 5.4.2 of the Trent Lakes official plan. The peer review of the applicant's environmental impact study does not agree with the applicant's interpretation of the growth plan and provincial policy statement. The County of Peterborough confirmed in an August 18th email that they hold the same view as the peer reviewer in that the proposal for the newly created lot does not meet the policies set out in the growth plan or provincial policy statement and cannot be supported. Staff are not in support of this proposed lot creation. Application B-18-23 does not conform to the Trent Lakes official plan nor the municipality's comprehensive zoning bylaw. Additionally, section 51, subject, subsection 24, pardon me, of the Planning Act establishes criteria for lot creation. Item D in this case mentions the suitability of land for the purpose of which it is to be subdivided. The proposed building envelope does not appear to be suitable for a rural residential lot in excess of 10 acres, as it is heavily constrained due to 
the envelope being wedged between two confirmed provincially significant wetlands. If approved, the resultant retained parcel would be left with defici deficient frontage pardon me, along County Road 36. Section 5.9.8.3 states, quote, no new lot shall be created by consent to a land severance within 120 meters of a provincially significant wetland, except where all applicable policies of this section are addressed to the satisfaction of the municipality and the appropriate approval authority, end quote. Section 6.2.1.12 of the Trent Lakes Official Plan states that severances are to be discouraged in low-lying areas and within areas containing significant wildlife or biological areas. The peer review of the applicant's environmental impact study does not agree with the applicant's interpretation of the growth plan and provincial policy statement. The County of Peterborough confirmed again in an August 18th email that they hold the same view as the peer reviewer and that the proposal does not of the newly created law does not meet the policies set out in the growth plan or provincial policy statement and cannot be supported. Staff are not in support of this proposed law creation. Application B-19-23 intends on creating a new right of way which staff do not support. The proposed right-of-way creates a new private road where a private road would not be warranted. The intent of section 6.2.1.4.2 of the Trent Lakes official plan is to utilize existing private roads for access or to limit the extension of existing private roads. The right-of-way would serve to create a new private road for a single dwelling that one, is currently situated on land that abuts a public road unless B-17-23 is granted and two currently is accessed by an existing private road fire route 81. Staff are not in support of this proposed application. Application B-20-23 is a proposed lot addition. The application appears to generally conform to the official plan, but doesn't to the comprehensive zoning bylaw. The severed lot is zoned Rural Exception 45, whereas the benefiting lot is zoned Shoreline Residential Private Access. A rezoning is required to ensure both lots are under the same zone classification. The retained parcel is required to have a minimum lot area of eight hectares or 20 acres. The resultant lot addition is expected to decrease the retained lot's overall area. The severed lands are designated rural under the current Trent Lakes official plan, whilst the residential development is technically permitted under this designation. The rural designation, when added to the smaller recreational dwelling area designation, will no longer meet the intent of the rural designation under the official plan, as the resulting lot fronts on Big Bald Lake will not be treated as a separate piece of land from the benefiting recreational dwelling area designated lot and meets the criteria for shoreline residential private access zoning. Thus, the severed lands should be redesignated to the recreational dwelling area. Thus, it is recommended that the applicant applies and is approved for an official plan amendment as a condition of consent. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that Council denies application file numbers B-17-23, B-18-23, and B-19-23. Staff recommend that Council supports the proposed severance file number B-20-23 with the following four conditions. One, a rezoning of the severed parcel be undertaken to the satisfaction of the municipality. Two, a rezoning of the retained parcel to the satisfaction of the municipality if required, or if the reference plan confirms the retained lot to be non-compliant with the minimum lot area requirement. Three, that the solicitor for the applicant provide an undertaking in writing which confirms that the lands are being conveyed to an abutting property owner and a merger of title shall take place. And finally, four, that an official plan amendment be applied for and obtained in order to bring the severed lot designated rule under the same designation as the benefiting parcel designated recreational dwelling area. Thank you.
Okay, that was a lot. A Thank lot. you very much. Okay, does anyone have any questions of Sarah? I'm seeing none. Does anyone have any idea of a motion that they would like to present? This is a complicated file. I mean, I understand that some of it is a very sensitive wetland area. There's lots of that. But the, the, uh, the one that you do seem to support does make sense to me. Okay, Councilor Graber. Through you, Mayor. Uh, once again, not my area of expertise, but just a question, uh, Sarah. Um, if Council supports the 20-23 with the four conditions, does that, uh, or how does that affect um, items 17, 18, and 19 23? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to you, Councillor Braybrook. Um, so it wouldn't directly affect 17, 18, or 19 because 17 and 18 uh, attempted to create two new lots for the purpose of building, and uh, number 19 was to create that new um, access to the initial lot 17. Um, so of course, if 17 is not being created, then there's no need to create that additional um, access through number 19. And it, it doesn't, number 19, what they've proposed doesn't really conform to our bylaw anyway, because um, it states that you can allow um, a uh, partial expansion to a fire route, right? So say um, a few meters just to gain access to a uh, a property that maybe pre predates or already exists, right? Whereas in this case, you're creating not only a new lot that has no access, direct access to that fire route, but you would actually be creating a completely separate access uh, essentially a new fire route to gain access to number 17. Um, the lot addition is more or less the individuals just taking a piece of their land uh, that exists on the property. It's uh, the lot line isn't drawn through any environmental features unlike the severed parcels, the proposed severed parcels and part of the proposed easement. Um, so really in looking with our official plan, it, it the provincial policy statement growth plan that lot addition is really the only one that conforms to any and all of our policies. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Sarah? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Friend. Uh, uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, wondering if we can handle uh, 17 and 18 and 19 as one motion and uh, 20 as a separate motion. I think that's quite reasonable if that's what you prefer to do. Okay. 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 Anyone prepared to make a uh, motion? I'll, I'll make that a motion that we deny 17, 18, and 19, and that we approve 20 with the recommendations made by staff. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? See Councillor Cadigan for a second. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion, soon their motions are carried. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, we can move on to 10.5 of our agenda, which is finance. And we can go to 10.5.1. And Chastity Robertson, our Deputy Treasurer, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you. Through you, Mayor Lamb said. The annual employee benefits plan renewal was negotiated on behalf of the municipality by Mosey and Mosey under the Peterborough Countywide Program. As a result of Mosey and Mosey's negotiations with Manulife, the finalized renewal will result in an annual premium decrease of 4%. I am recommending that Council receive the report and further that Council approve the Manulife Employee Group Benefit Renewal effective November 1st, 2023. Okay, thank you very much, Jasmine. Do you have any questions or is prepared to make a motion? Let's see, Councillor Braver, go ahead. I'll make a motion to uh, the council receive the report and uh, approve the uh, manual life employee group benefit renewal. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? 
That motion was carried. Thank you very much, Chastity. Okay, we can move on to 10.5.2 of our agenda, which is Donna Taggart, our CAO treasurer. Would you like to speak to this item, Don? Yes, thank you and through you. So before you is a 2024 budget timetable, which shows the particulars of the uh, 2024 budget planning process. So this new budget schedule has extended the time frame for public feedback. The format of this feedback has also been expanded to include specific questions being asked, which was a request included in 2023 budget feedback received. To date, there have already been 31 responses received, which is up, I think we received about 20 overall last year. So it's anticipated that the budget timetable before you allows sufficient time for 2024 budget planning and will allow council to adopt the budget by February, 2024. The request today is that council receive the budget timetable report from the CAO treasurer for information. Thank you very much, Donna. Anyone have any questions about the budget timetable? I do have one issue with one of the dates <laughs> on there. So yeah. I will not be in this country on November 20th, but yes. other than that, we can move along. So thank you and through you. So the second request today would be to change the November 20 uh, budget meeting date uh, to accommodate the mayor. So we would be looking at perhaps the 27th or 28th, but I believe early discussions with council uh, would appear the 28th is the, is the best date, but we would uh, seek council support to change that November 20th date, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Did we get a motion yet? Anyone prepared to make a motion? I see Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a mover. And Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Is there any conversation? Go ahead, Councillor Braybrook. Yeah, through you, Mayor. Um, do we add uh, that we support the changing of the November 20th date to the November 28th, 2023 date to that motion? Sure. I think we can. Okay. So, a friendly amendment to that uh, that we receive the budget timetable report for information purposes and that we uh, support the changing of the November 20th, 2023. Uh, date to November 28th, 2023. Is the mover and seconder okay with that friendly amendment? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. Fine. Okay. Any other conversation about the motion? I see none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we can move on to 10.5.3 of the agenda, which is Donna Taggart, our CAO treasurer, but lab, but lab reserve transfers. Yes, thank you, and through you. So I am requesting uh, support from council to transfer $3,000 from the Buckhorn Regional Health Center Blood Lab Reserve for the continued work of the blood lab technician. So as council will recall, there was a trust fund created in 2013 for blood lab services at the Buckhorn Regional Health Center and monies in that trust fund are received through donations. The administrator at the center requests funds as required for the work of the blood lab technician. And at this time, there is a request for an additional $3,000. So therefore today, I'm requesting that council support the transfer of $3,000 from the Buckhorn Regional Health Center Blood Lab Reserve for the continued work of the lab technician and after this transfer, there will be a balance remaining of 10,741.77. Okay, thank you very much, Donna. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? I'm seeing none. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Go ahead, Councillor Franz. I'd be prepared to make a motion to support. It seems like a reasonable request. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We can move on now to 10.5.4 of our agenda, which is Donna Taggart, our CAO treasurer. The accounts payable. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. And through you, before you is the accounts payable for the month of August. For your information, you will see that we continue to uh, have many electronic payments. We're headed in the right direction there. So just for your information. Thank you very much. 
Anyone have any comments or questions? None. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Okay. Councilor Braver? Make a motion that I receive the report. Do you want a seconder for that motion? The Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any other conversation? I see none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much. Now we can move on to 10.6 of our agenda, which is administration. And we can go to 10.6.1. Which is Donna Taggart, our CAO Trevor. Treasurer, would you like to speak to this item? Yes, thank you and through you. So before you is a report recommending a change to the application review process for radio communication facilities. In 2015, the municipality entered into an arrangement with the Canadian Radio Communications Information and Notification Service, or CRINS, for the review of new and modified radio communication facility applications towers and antenna systems. Unfortunately, there have been ongoing issues with services being provided by CRINs that have resulted in applications being processed, have not, not being processed in a timely manner. These concerns have been brought forward by radio communication facility proponents and staff. Staff have made several unsuccessful attempts to contact CRINs in the hope of addressing these concerns. It is the recommendation today that Council directs staff to terminate the arrangement with CRINs effective September 19, 2023, and that any existing applications on file with CRINs be returned to the municipality. Staff are also looking for Council to direct planning staff to create proposed protocols and guidelines for establishing radio communication facilities in Trent Lakes, and that these be brought back to the October 3rd regular meeting for approval. After the approval of these new protocols, staff will be able to proceed with the five applications currently, I believe, underway for Trent Lakes. So, and uh, just an acknowledgement that um, staff recognize that municipalities uh, can provide comment, but they do not have the authority to prevent the construction of these facilities. But it is important to involve the municipality from a planning perspective. So I know Adele can speak to this further as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions or comments? For go ahead. Okay. Hey, Mayor. Uh, just <clears throat> more housekeeping uh, in the uh, recommendation um, through you, Mayor, uh, to to Donna. Um, you mentioned uh, as part of the recommendation to have any documents returned to to the municip municipality. Right. Okay. Is that in this the the three points? So no, thank you and through you. No, we would look to add that. Uh, we would look to, to end the, the arrangement with them and also include that so that that came after. So we'd look to add that to the resolution, please. Okay, any other questions or comments? Councillor Franzen. Yeah, I'm just wondering if uh, uh, with what, what's recommended, if uh, we could get that tower up by March. So that there's no gap in service. So, Adele, would you? Mind? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we're doing our best. To, the protocol will be be before council on October 3rd. Um, I have it almost completed, and as soon as uh, council approves that, we'll be able to be looking at the applications, and it has to be processed within 120 days. Um, in talking with the representative of Bell for the relocation of this tower, they indicate that the tower would have to be constructed by the end of March, not just having approvals. So as I was thinking, I'd like to speak with our chief building official because there's something called a conditional building permit. And I don't know if this tower would, um, would be able to qualify for that. So I would like some further discussion and we'll be able to bring that forward to council in the report on October 3rd. Does the tower need a building permit? That's a question that Through I, you, I want Mayor. to ask you, but I, I want to ask Matthew as well, but I don't think we can ask Matthew at this point. Through you, Mr. Mayor, my understanding it may with whatever's on the ground at the base of the tower, so I'm assuming there may be a requirement for a building <coughs> permit, but I'm not totally sure. That's why I'd like to discuss that option with our chief building official. I, I, 
think I'm pretty sure that it doesn't because I think they're all modular pieces that are put there to, to supplement the power. But I'm not positive on that. I don't know if it's okay if I ask Matthew one question. Could I ask Matthew Milligan? Could you speak to that just for one second, please? Telecommunications, so as it because it's federally regulated, you're not required to build a permit. It's not built as per the Ontario building code, they're built as per the national building code. Typically, a building permit is not taken out. Um, but with that said, the site is built as per the national building code. So, I mean, you can be assured that the site is that it's safe and meets all the requirements of a, a federal facility, but it's not subject to the purview of, of, of building site. Now, with this said, if I just by name, all telecommunication sites, it's very clear I said requires at the end of the day consultation, public consultation, and um, also a statement of concurrence from the land use authority. So, if we're, if we're actually appreciate the staff maybe considering how this matter could be expedited through the building permit process. But at the end of the day, the regulator, Bell regulator, conditional license to Bell, we are required to ensure that somehow, some way, a consultation process happens with the public. And that council, um, as the land use authority, provide a statement of concurrence. And uh, so again, we just could not build a replacement site based on a uh, provisional building permit. Okay. Thank you for that comment. And I'm, I'm concerned about timelines myself. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times that power gets used in a day or a month or a week or a year. So I mean, without services from that tower for another six months, eight months, a year, before you could actually start building it, seems very problematic to me and a bit of a danger to our ratepayers. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Lamb. So first of all, thank you for bringing this forward because I know you've been involved and raised it as a free alarm fire, which it is. <laughs> um, I don't think this needs to be in the motion, but if I could ask staff to uh, consider a temporary protocol as one of the possibilities uh, when they look at our, our proposal. Uh, as well as any way to expedite the processing of this particular application, because to me, it is priority number one. I don't know what the other four are, but I know that losing the tower at Flynn's Corners uh, will leave a very significant gap and it become a real problem for us. So I'd like to see this particular one um, uh, prioritized and expedited. Is that the motion? Uh, uh, I, if you'd like, I can make the motion and include that as sort of a fourth comment, or I can make a separate, I'd probably make a separate motion on that one. Okay. So, so yes, I would make a motion. I think I should wait until after we- I think we're, yeah, we're communicating about the first motion. Yeah, I think we should get this one. So, okay, we- In place first. Go ahead, Councillor Braver, if you have another comment. Through you, Mayor, uh, I was uh, prepared to make a motion on uh, Donna, Donna's- Okay. Presentation. Sorry. The council receives a report. Uh, the council directs staff to provide notice to the Canadian Rated Communications Information and Notification Service, also known as CRINS, to terminate membership for Trent Lakes effective September 19, 2023, and that CRINS returns any outstanding documentation uh, to the municipality, uh, and further that council direct planning staff to create proposed protocols and guidelines for establishing radio communication facilities within the municipality of Trent Lakes, and that these be brought back to the October 3, 2023 regular meeting. Okay, thank you very much for your motion. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor, that motion is carried. Deputy Mayor Armstrong, would you like to make a subsequent motion? I would. Thank you, Chris. Please. Um, whereas <laughs> the cell tower at Flynn's Corners, uh, that many people rely on that cell tower for communications, both at home and uh, in transit, uh, it is very important. Uh, therefore, Council directs staff to uh, prepare an expedited plan for the approval of that particular location, or that application, if you will, uh, and perhaps draft a schedule uh, for 
um, schedule providing for the necessary steps in order to get to approval. I'm thinking public consultation, okay. et cetera, et cetera, okay. notices, et cetera. Okay, if we move to page seven of the presentation, it's a temporary protocol. It only applies to 1625 County Road 507. Maybe that could be go, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if I can suggest instead of having the default protocol, like this is our first application, mm -hmm. what I would suggest is perhaps if you give direction to staff to even though our protocol won't be to council until October 3rd, perhaps we can work with uh, Bell and start advancing the public consultation process where we can give them some information in terms of newspaper notifi notification and they can start that process to see when the newspaper could publish these notifications and at least we could start that 30-day consultation in advance of our protocol because the protocol definitely has that in there. Let me can I change the, withdraw the motion? No, to no, one. <laughs> uh, make it simple. Uh, the council directs staff uh, to uh, consider uh, the approval process for the Flynn's Tower uh, relocation uh, starting as soon as the uh, contract with Prince is uh, terminated. And as part of that, to consider a temporary protocol as one of the processes we might look at for expediting that application. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. And Jesse can work Smith, I'm sure. And if we need to say more, we can have a meeting to do more. I think this is very important for us to proceed somehow yes. with even just the public consultation <laughs> section, which is a few days, right? So in them 30 days, we can probably come up with the appropriate wording of a protocol for Trent Lakes for that one tower. So I'm going to actually ask for a seconder for that motion. The Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call her to vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We look forward to some communication between Bell and our planning staff. Thank you very much. Okay, we can move on now to some other section of our agenda. It's 10.6.2, and it's a ratio start for economic development and marketing coordinator. Rachel, can you please speak to this item? Thank you and through you. Uh, before you is a report regarding the draft external communication strategy. Following the creation of the internal communication strategy to solidify communications within the municipality, an external communication strategy has been created to be implemented alongside it. The external communication strategy is to be a guiding document that will support, identify, and develop external communication practices, policies, and procedures. This will ensure that municipal communications will become more effective, relevant, clear, and engaging between the public and municipal staff and council. The recommendation is that council receive the report on the draft external communication strategy for information, and further that comments on the draft strategy be provided to staff by October 31st, 2023, for a follow-up report to council with a corresponding implementation plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. Okay, any questions for Rachel or comments from council? Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lampson. Um, thank you, Rachel, for this. Um, I think you've done a really excellent job incorporating both the recommendations that were made by letter M, uh, which was given to us in the middle of the pandemic, which slowed us down a little bit, um, as well as all of the commentary that was received from the public in many different channels. So I'm fully supportive of this uh, uh, strategy. Um, and I also think that you nailed it in terms of what is it we try and do with our external communication. We try and inform, we engage, and we promote. That's it. I think that, I think that absolutely says it in, in a punchy sort of uh, direct way. So it's just a comment and I would make the motion to receive the report and uh, that we allow for any comments be provided to staff by October 31st. Okay, thank you very much for your motion. Deputy Mayor Armstrong, do I have a seconder for that motion? Seeing Councillor Brayrock for a seconder. Any other conversation? I see none, I see, okay. 
Sorry, right, Councilor Brady. Through you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to make a comment as well. Thank you uh, very much, Rachel, for all your work on this, and and also your work on um, work with our uh, community uh, residents and our associations and whatnot. Uh, I know uh, we appreciate it. So thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments, Councilor Braybrook. I must agree. I think that this is a, a very fulsome plan, and I think that some few more comments I'm sure we'll get. We can help adjust it a little if we need to, but I think it's a very comprehensive report. Thank you very much. And Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Deputy thank you Arnold. through your ranch. Um, Richard, the only other comment I wanted to make is this is a very ambitious plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's very comprehensive and it does sort of uh, take into account the feedback. Um, I would encourage you to work with uh, with Donna and others to prioritize it because I don't know that we have the capacity to deliver on all of it. Um, we certainly covered everything, but uh, I just worry that you, you know, get overloaded and are frustrated because you can't deliver on everything that's in there. Good comment. Good observation, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Okay, all the conversation is done. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we can move on to item 10.7 of corporate services. 10.7.1, pay off the executive. Can you, Deputy Clerk, can you please speak to the item? Thank you, and through you, Mayor Lambshead. Before you are the council expenses received for the month of August for council's approval and authorization. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm prepared to make a motion. Councillor Franzen for a mover. I'll make a motion to support this. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item 11, which is correspondence for information. Want to, we could receive these all at once, all three of them, or we can talk about them individually, whatever the council desires. Go ahead, Councillor Braver. Uh, I was wondering if uh, we'd be able to pull it at uh, 11.2. Sure. So, so let's just go down the order then. If we're going to take one out, we might as well do them individually. Uh, item 11.1 for resolution regarding changes to fifth. Go ahead. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Uh, motion to receive. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. We will now to 11.2, the Township of Kilowa. And I think Councillor Braver, if you wanted to speak to this. Yeah, it's it's more of a through you, Mayor. Yeah, it's more of a question of how to proceed uh, but I just reading this it, it makes makes a lot of sense I like the three points um, as far as um, requiring owners using digital platforms to comply with municipal planning and licensing regulations and the other two points um, is there a process that we uh, provide a support letter or do we just uh, motion to support I, I think we do so but if, if, if we support it that's that's our notice that we're supporting it i think so is that true through you mayor, through you mayor lamb said um when council does uh provide a resolution of support um uh an email is sent to the um the municipality that sent the original one um expressing our support I will note that I believe council has supported this one in the past, yeah. and this is a resolution of support. And I believe you supported the original one. This would just be um, some municipalities circulate it to all Ontario municipalities, but that's not our practice. So I will uh, take direction <laughs> as to how to proceed. Uh, do, we, do we just... Um... If, if if you're interested in supporting it, just you we can you can make a resolution to a motion to support it. Okay. Well, through you, Mayor, I'll make a motion to support eleven uh, point two. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I'll second that. I see Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? 
that motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to 11.3 of our agenda. You want to talk about it or you want to make a motion? I see Councillor Franzen for a mover. Uh, just a motion to receive. We've uh, we've dealt with this issue in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have a seconder for that motion. Let's see Councillor Gadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item 12 of our agenda, which is correspondence for action. We can move on to 12.1 as the town of Grimsby. Guaranteed livable income. Go ahead, Councillor Franz. Uh, I'm just going to make a motion to receive. I believe it's uh, very distinct to Grimsby, the, the points that they've made in this motion. Do I have a second? I see Councillor Graber for a seconder. Any conversation? See Councillor Graber, go ahead. Just through you, Mayor, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Franzen as far as it's very subjective and, and pointed to, uh, to Grimsby. So. Okay. 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 Uh, any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, we can move on to 12.2 of our agenda, which is the Lake Worth Tall Board. Would anyone like to speak to this? Go ahead, Councillor Gray. I was assuming you would. Yeah. <laughs> I should never assume. No, that's fine. Thank you. Through through you, Mayor. As I mentioned earlier in the uh, in the agenda, that uh, our, the Lakers Hall is um, uh, has been chosen by um, festival of uh, uh, concerts. Uh, I believe it's, uh, it's referenced Ontario Festival of Small Halls. Uh, and it's uh, it's quite quite a unique opportunity, uh, and it's um, it's a feather in the cap to the municipality as far as being chosen, uh, one of the uh, halls being chosen for this event. Um, there's some pretty, uh, I guess, high level acts that have been coming through and on October 14th, they've chosen the Lakers Hall location for, uh, I believe it's a brother's duel. It's uh, the Abrams that are gonna be entertaining and, and whatnot, so, and that's, uh, that's prompted this uh, special occasion uh, from a re request. Thank you very much for the information. Anyone prepared to make a motion? Seeing Councillor Braybrook for a mover. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Councillor Franzen. Any other conversation? Just a question. Are, are there tickets available? There are. There, they are online. So if okay. you went to Ontario Festival of Small Halls, uh, there, there are tickets available. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, any other conversation? I'm seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? Motion has carried. Okay, we can move on to item 13 of our agenda, which is bylaws. I don't think we have any others that are on a report on the agenda, so we can move right along. We can receive them all in one motion, or we can receive them individually, which is the council prefers. Go ahead, Councilor Brady. I'll make a motion to receive them all. We have a motion to receive them all. I have a seconder, Councillor Cadigan. I have any conversation, Deputy Mayor. Yes, just a clarification. I believe we need to approve these. Yes, just yes, sorry. Yes, yes, we do need to approve them. Uh, yes, they're they're bylaws that are on our agenda. Yeah. Thank you. Friendly amendment. Friendly amendment through you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to uh, approve all three. Thank you very much, Thank you. Councillor Armstrong, for catching that. And we have that's okay with the seconder. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to business arising out of the previous meeting. Anyone have any business arising out of the previous meeting? I'm seeing none. Any notices of a motion on item 15? I'm seeing none. Any information items? Item 16 on our agenda. I'm seeing none. I will now entertain a motion to go into closed session, which is 17.1 on our agenda. We're going into closed because the Municipal Act, Section 239.2, to discuss E, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, statement of claim. F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, statement of claim. K, 
a position plan procedure or criteria for construction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on for on behalf of the municipality or local board in negotiations. That is the reason do I have a move? Councillor Cadigan for a movender. Do I have a seconder? I have Councillor Franzen for a seconder. All in favor? The motion is carried. We are going into close for the reasons stated before. Okay, we can move on to 7.2 of our agenda, which is rise from cold. I would entertain a motion to rise. See Councillor Braybrook and Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. All in favor? That motion is carried. We are now back in for a regular council meeting. We'll go to item 18 of our agenda, which is business arising out of our closed meeting, and we have the minutes to adopt. Anyone prepared to make a motion to do so? See Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a mover. Councillor Braver for a seconder. Any conversation about the minutes? I'm seeing them. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can move on to item 19 of our agenda, which is the adoption of the confirming bylaw. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? I see Councillor Franzen for a mover, Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. All in favor? That motion is carried. I can move on now to item 20 of our agenda, which is adjournment. Would anyone like to adjourn? I see Councillor Cadigan for a mover. We don't want to play. I see Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. I'll call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We are adjourned.